Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Panos Tapas, and I'm the treasurer of the Macedonian Society of Great Britain. I'm deeply honored by the opportunity to introduce our distinguished guest speaker tonight. Sir Basil Magazinis has held tenured professorships at the University of Cambridge, Oxford, Queen Mary College, University College London, Leiden in the Netherlands, and the Law School of the University of Texas Austin, where he now holds the title of Emeritus Professor of Comparative Law. He has also held for several years part-time chairs at the Universities of Paris, Sorbonne and Saint, Munich, Siena, Genoa, Rome, the Cornell, Cornell Law School, and the Michigan Law School. His 53 books, or more than 53 books, over 150 law articles and over 100 articles have dealt with miscellaneous matters such as law, the traveling of ideas, psychobiography, the classics in art, and have earned him fellowships in the academies of Belgium, Britain, France, and Netherlands, and Europe, in addition to the Athens Psychological Society and the American Law Institute as well as many honorary doctorates from Athens, Gent, Munich, Oxford, Oxford and Paris, Sorbonne. In 1997, on the advice of the Lord Chancellor, he was appointed by Her Majesty the Queen as one of her councillors in law. And in the New Year's Honours List of 2005, on the, on the advice of the then Prime Minister, he was knighted by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II for exceptional services to international relations. For his work, he has also received from the Presidents of France, Germany and Italy the Grand Cross of the Order of Merit of France and Italy, as well as the Grand Officer's Cross with Star of the German Order of Merit, as well as the insignia of the Commander of the Legion of Honor of France. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Sir Vasily. The thing is that uh, the success uh, of the Oedipus Rex uh, leads Euripides to write his own version. His own version, Yocasta, is a liar. She doesn't commit suicide. And Yocasta, who accompanies the Oedipus in his peregrinations, not the two daughters, and the audience and his meaning. So it's a completely different story, but because it only survives in extracts, nobody reads it, so, so very few people read it, and therefore you don't know the story. The full story, the variations of the story. And that is the basic problem. And that's why I have to make this introduction to the question of Dionysus. Because he's one of the most complicated, and perhaps even important, gods of ancient Greece. And I say it's very complicated, because as you will see, there are various the theories and stories about Dionysus, and they're not the same. But one thing that is there is that Dionysus is part of the Greek mythology, the Greek religion, and the Greek plays and stories written about him from about 12 or 1300 BC, with the earliest examples. Once they thought that it was Thrace and Macedonia, because the movement came from three years and Libya into Thrace and into Macedonia and into the rest of Greece. But they discovered uh, stones, carvings, linear A and B in Hanya, in Crete, which show that it was there already in the 12th century BC. And he was there adored with the supreme goddess of Crete. She's not named. But it's Ariadne, the supreme goddess of Crete. And he's there always with the bulls, because Dionysus sometimes appears in the form of a bull. He changes his shape. And of course, bulls, as you know, are a uh, pictorial symbol uh, for Crete and honey. So it's very interesting, because that's a completely new theory and approach. Did the cult of wine he was the god of wine. The cult of the vineyards come from Phoenicia to Crete and from Crete to Europe, to Greece. Or is there also truth to say that the movement from 
Greece, Macedonia, and southern Hungary took place at the same time. Not only that, as we come into the 6th century, 7th century, for example, we have the first appearance, the first new one of sources, Zagreb, she's called, Zagreb, who is connected with the Orphic mysteries in Elefsina. And he is born by Zeus inseminating his niece, who is the daughter of Ithera <coughs> of Severny. Zeus becomes a snake and he inseminates his niece. There is another theory that he might even be his daughter. And Dionysus is born. A century later, we have a completely different myth, the one that we find in Euripides' play, and we have Zeus inseminating Semele. Semele is one of the four daughters that the king of Thebes, Carlos, had. He had four daughters, Semele, Agave, Ione, Iona, Io, Io, and uh, Afdoloi. Four daughters. He didn't have a son. He had four daughters. Carlos uh, was a Phoenician. He came from Sinon. He was the brother of Europa. Europa was the woman who was kidnapped by Zeus in the form of a bull. He left Sidon and he came to Greece to find his sister, but instead of looking in Crete, he started looking in the center of Greece. And finally, Delphi told him, you must find, find create a new city, Thebes, and he's the first king, and he's the person who brings the Phoenician alphabet to Greece, except for the vowels. The Greeks had the vowels, and from then on their language became extremely poor. There are some people in our country these days that tell you that Greek is a dead language. It is not. And I can give you examples if you want. It's a vital and lively and powerful language, as is our culture. And it is our duty to protect our culture. It is our duty to teach the young people, whether they are Greek or foreign, of our past. We must know where we belong. And we must respect not only our past, but also we must respect our religion. Because without it, we wouldn't be where we are now. These are important. And we need surprise you, I think it will, but I will mention it nevertheless. But a politician, I won't take the country yet, once said that if you don't know who I need is Kufias? And who is What is your origin? What is your background? You can never have an efficient and effective foreign geopolitical policy. Who said that? Ahmed Daoud said that about Turkey. Why does it look like a Turk and not a Greece? Why must we forget? Did you see it two days ago? how moving the ceremony was about the people who gave their lives so that we could have a future. They are very important lessons that one can learn from the past. So what we say is not just history, but it's complicated history. And it's complicated because, as I tell you, we have a new version now. Zeus inseminates so then, and then he makes a mistake because so then he says, I want to see you in all your glory. And that means I want to see you with your thunderbolt. He comes along and he tries to find a little Gerardo to start the boom <laughs> and impress the girl. But he makes a mistake. He burns her. He kills her. And just in time, he manages to remove the child from her womb and transplants it not in the head. He already had, I think, enough of the head. He had used that. He puts it on his thigh, and eventually the god is born. And when the god is born, his sister, who's also his wife, his sister, who's also his wife, the Greek myths in their original Neolithic form are terribly cruel. They are terribly perverse. They are terribly ugly. Because he's married to his sister, Ira, who 
who's her sister. He's very jealous because her husband is always changing himself into a swan or a snake or an ant or a bull in order to have an affair or needle. But he sees a nice young little boy, and though no controls in those days, you see, now we live in an era of a lot of controls. Uh, of course, a reaction has to be done. There has to be some kind of reaction, but on the other hand, we always run the risk in life as we try to rectify one mistake. We go over the whole debate at the other end and commit a new mistake. We go too far in one way or the other. That's why the second of the Parangema in Delphi was Vilenava. The first was Grothi Sertko. Now, what am I saying? She comes. She tries to kill the baby. And Dionysus, Dionysus is moved to Asia Minor and is brought up by <coughs> the equivalent goddess of Rhea, Kivei. And then we have the most authoritative, the most clear, the most full, the most reliable account of the Bacchic movement by Euripides after he's left Athens in 411. He can't bear it any longer in Athens. Athens is decaying, Athens is dying, democracy is dying. The people are pedantic. They are boring. They make mistakes. And the greatest mistake which he describes in the women of Troy, there are others. Huh? They destroy the temples of the gods. And the two gods, Poseidon and Athena, get together and say they destroyed our temples. We are going to punish them now. Their return back to Greece is going to be very difficult. It is a city in decay. It is a city in transition. It is a city where everything is happening. There's death. There's war. There's disaster. There's refugees. They're homeless. They're widows. They're young children. What am I describing? Greece in 410, in heaven, 404? Or Europe? Greece of today. Syria, Lebanon, Asia Minor. Period of transition, period of uncertainty. A world is dying and the new one has not yet emerged. People are confused. And that's what the back is about. Because all those followers of Dionysus are abandoned women, widows, people who are poor, people who no longer have a home, people who are homeless, people who are abandoned, living in a city which was once was beautiful, the greatest of all cities. And now it is decaying. And in their desperation, they need some palliative. They find it in wine, as modern people find it in drugs. But wine and drugs solves some of the symptoms for a short time, but not the causes. That's why all these people are leaving, leaving the cities and following the new world. And then, third century, second century, a growing contact with the East begins. Heresies and other dark movements start coming from the East to Greece. And there's a great exchange. In that context, Christianity begins to emerge. It's a new religion, but it doesn't yet have its own philosophical foundations. The philosophy is provided by Greeks, the Stoics. And the philosophy is expressed in that wonderful man, a Jew who became a Christian and wrote in Greek, St. Paul. One of the deepest thinkers of Christianity and of the world, who brings everything together. And you have a movement in the second century, first century, or first, second century, after the birth of Christ, where a new religion, Judaism, a new religion, Christianity, are trying to find their place in the world and find how they're going to coexist with 
the world of Greece. And nowhere is this done more powerfully, nowhere is the clash more strong than in northern Egypt, Alexandria, where the Greeks were very powerful. So what you see in the fourth century, third century, you see philosophers Calypis of Alexandria, you see others writing books, there is a book called the Odyssea written in 495, it is the longest Greek poem. The Inhead and the Odyssey are about 12 to 14,000 verses, this is 22,000 verses. And the effort that all these people are making is how can they bring together the Dionysian religion, the Greek religion and the Christian religion. They start finding common things. Both have a god who's born from a human being and a god, Semele and Zeus. Maria, the virgin, and God, both have a god who does wonders. Both have a god who is crucified, killed, and yet is resurrected. Both have a ritual in which the wine plays an important part in the religious ceremony. Could the two come together? <coughs> what is really happening is, and I'm putting things in a very different way, is what is really happening is that in the northern part of Egypt, which is the last stronghold of Hellenism, just before the third, fourth, fifth century, AD, after the birth of Christ, in a period like that, you have an effort to see how the two philosophies, the two religions, can coincide, survive in one way or another. It's a big battle, it's an intellectual battle. But of course, intellectual battles are very difficult to describe to ordinary people if you describe them through myths, through stories. One of the great beauties of the parables of Christ is that they're talking about real and important things, but in a simple way so that simple people can understand them. So that is the background that we have to examine to understand the Dionysian movement, the Bacchic movement, and how it affected life and art in Greece and then the rest of the world. Because they're relevant, most of these things still, in our times. And I want to focus on three things. A really great originality of Euripides in his work. The first amazing innovation in that tragedy is that you had, for the first time, the discussion of the phenomenon which is called repressed sexuality. Sexuality, again, comfortable, difficult, confusing. No legal system ever helped organize, structure the legal status of people who were genuine hermaphrodites, what gay, man and wife man and woman, both sexes in one. They happened. The first time this was ever discussed in a legal text was the Prussian Code of 1791. But this is a modern problem. Even today we can't cope with it to decide whether you belong to the male or the female sex and how to handle you. Whether, as you saw, Church of England recently said that young children in a school at the age of four or five must be encouraged to discover their own sexuality. I think they're going too far. I think we're becoming a bit crazy. I may be wrong. But well, that's not the point. The point of a teacher when he lectures is very different from the point of a politician when he talks. A politician talks because he wants to vote. A lawyer talks 
because he wants to win that case. An academic talks because he wants to make you think. But one explore what's happening and how you can learn from the past before it's too late. Repress sexuality. Freud, it, who dealt with it in three essays on sexuality from about 1894, he never stopped making additions and changes to his three essays. And uh, he thought that this is a very serious problem and if you don't know how to handle it, in later stage, it can lead to very serious neurosis in a person who is of a confused sexuality. And that is what applies to Dionysus, the god, and that is what applies to Bentheus, the son of Ahami, who is the grandson of Carlos, who is the king of Thebes. Even before he meets the new god, whom he's fighting with fanaticism, even before he meets the new god, he hates him. But at the same time, he says, I hear he's good looking. I can give you the lines, but it would make it a very serious dull lecture. Instead of keeping the temple, which is very tired for me, but very enjoyable for you, or instructive for you. Because later on when he sees him, he spends six verses admiring this man whom he calls Philippus. What a nice skin he has. What beautiful and penetrating eyes he has. What a nice beard he has. Six lines. Six lines is a lot because the whole tragedy. Can you guess? And this is another sign of the genius of the Greeks that they could write a tragedy, they could write a theatrical piece that would keep the audience engaged. And it was only 14, 1500 lines maximum. Two articles in any newspaper. And you read them, you don't understand them if you read your bottle the next day. But two articles, 14, 1500 lines, you have this whole plot. And in there, six lines about how pretty Penthes finds Dionysus. And then we have the opposite happening too. Dionysus seems to like Penthes before he decides to exterminate him, destroy him, and Thebes, and his mother. He tries to convert him to a new religion. And you have, and you find them in the book, some amazing statements exchanged between the two. At one stage, the god gets so cross with the king that he throws him into his palace in Thebes, locks him up in a place where the horses are, and a bull is there. And that's the question. Is that a bull, or is it a god? Masquerade as a bull. And we have Penthes fighting with the bull. His heart is palpitating. He's sweating. He's fighting. What is he fighting? Or do we have poets, writers, authors actually telling us that that is in fact the first hidden sexual encounter between the god and Penthes? He may be hallucinating, but many people say that in moments of great stress and difficulty, that's what the psychiatrists and other people say, the chances of hallucination can increase. And Davis comes out and he says, I see two things, I see, I see two sons. What's happening? What's happening here? He is gradually degenerating, collapsing. He can't cope. And then the god comes and gets his revenge. He says, why are you agitating? He says, I can't stand what's happening up in the mountains where the women, the 
the Manantras and the other followers of Dionysus are doing. You have descriptions in there. It's the only description we have that is so detailed about what the Bhakti did in the mountains. In any point, that's where it takes place. There were two mountains nearby my source, and any point is where all the bad things are happening. And any point is there. And you have women not breastfeeding their children, but giving their milk to baby animals. Their children are not weaned, but the animals get the mother's milk, and their orgies, and there's dancing, and there's sociological material, which I cite in the article, which says that other cultures have used the dancing as a way of getting genuinely excited, the dervishes, or others in America, or even the Anastenadarians. So, you see what's happening, and Pentheus wants to go and see them. And the god is going to encourage him to do it because the god wants to destroy him. So he tells him, if you want to go up there, they'll kill you. These women are crazy, which includes his sisters, by the way, and his mother, and his aunts. They all joined the king and the god against their brother, their nephew, the king. So, what is going to happen here? And then you have a second scene described in the tragedy, which is amazing. I'll dress you up as a woman, so they won't notice you. And there's been thefts. The king, who's dressed up as a woman, was going to walk through thieves, and all his citizens will see him become the laughing stock of his town, so that he can go up the mountain and act like a peeping tom. See the one hunters do whatever they do. And again, it's an amazing process psychologically how Dionysus perverts his mind and thinking. He says, look, I'm protecting you. And the king says, you're right. Look how nice you look, dressed up as a woman. Transvestism. It's a real phenomenon which in Greece at the time was allowed in moments of initiation ceremonies to a new religion or to a new thing. Why? Because by changing your dress, you're also changing yourself. By joining the movement, you were actually indicating to the world that your philosophy was changing. You were open. And you have, if you read it, I have the book here, and you can see how marked it is, but I don't want to spend the time giving you those examples. What do you have? You have the king saying, am I well dressed? Is my hair as nice as my sister? Do I walk? Am I chic? Am I better looking than my sister? He's being degraded in the process of discussing this phenomenon which has not appeared in any literature before. That's one of the great innovations of this tragedy. The second one, the second one is the distinction that Euripides makes between the way individuals think and the way masses think. That difference was not discussed by sociologists or philosophers until the French Revolution. Nobody had noted the difference that you as an individual could react logically, but once you are put together with a big group, you lose your ability to be logical and you follow the mass. Well, it happened in the French Revolution. Well, then one of the historians gives us a fantastic and gruesome example when the people occupy the Bastille, which is unguarded, only 12 soldiers there, and the governor. And they find the governor, the Bastille, the symbol of cruelty of the past. They find the governor, 
And as they're walking around, they trip over his sword because it's sticking out. And immediately the crowd turns around and says, that's treason, we must kill him. Who will kill him? And they look around and they find in the group a butcher who has a knife, a butcher's knife. They say, you kill him because you have the knife. And how did he respond? Because he's part of this excitement, this paranoia, the excitement. He says, well, if the country wants me to do this, it is my duty to obey. He brings out the knife. He carves a jihadist jaw. Not in Iraq or Syria, 10 years ago. In a great tragedy described by Euripides. And an example which shows that the reaction of people when there's a mass is no longer logical. And of course, that continues throughout the 19th century, and it is studied by lecturers and speakers. And they finally develop a theory. How does this intoxication of the masses take place? Euripides has said it in a tragedy. What has he said? Three things. One, you have a simple message, not complicated. People, the masses, can't understand subtleties. A simple message. And two, you repeat it over and over again until it spreads like a medical disease. And three, the person who does it, the leader, is always there. You know what? The Marche is the only tragedy in ancient Greece where the god who causes all the problems is in the play from the very beginning to the very end. He's there applying his theory. He's there intoxicating people, perverting their thinking and leading them to crime. There's a marvelous book by a professor, psychiatrist, doctor, Jost Merlo, a Dutchman uh, who practiced in Holland before the war, during the war, and after the war. And he saw, and he's described it, the destruction of the human mind is the title of his book. It's worth reading. He saw how the German propaganda worked. And it worked in the way, briefly, because all this is done in 14, 1390 lines is the length of the Marche, and then 20 lines was it, 1400. We saw it in Nuremberg. There isn't a better example of this theory, of this organization of the crowds on a huge scale where a simple message leads them to behave in a truly frightening, insensitive, dangerous manner. And is that the end of it? No. Because now we have other occasions where people can get together and they can misled, be misled. You can have huge pop concerts and drugs. You can have football people gathering and going crazy. You have the social media which can reach you without you actually being there. But nevertheless applying the same principles and changing you. That is again a novelty which has never been discussed before and is not going to be discussed until the 19th century because of the French Revolution and because of the Revolution of 1848. So you see, the kind of innovations that we have in one tragedy, which is the result of the phenomenon I just told you, the collapse of the society. What is, I dare say, interesting in my little booklet is that I'm analyzing the tragedy not textually, 
but sociologically and psychologically. That is new, but the impetus, the idea, the urge to do it like that is not mine. It comes from one of the greatest classical scholars that Oxford had, Professor Dodds, who was a professor, Regius Professor of Classics in Oxford for many years in the 50s and 60s, and he said, textually, he made it up. The tragedy has been analyzed over and over again. If you want to say something new, you must look at it from a different angle. Sociological, political, psychological, but different. We are not undermining the work of the true real scholars, the classicists. We are aiming it. They are afraid. When I lecture and I've been and I've spoken to them, they're very defensive. We are classicists. They're not interested in psychology. Psychology is not a proper science. Psychology or psychiatry is it's not for us. We can't rely. But you can't reject in life something simply because you've never tried it and tested it. So Paul, first epistle to the Thessalonians, Panda Vojimazate, Tokalongate. And you know what? I had to go to England and study classics in England to notice something that I hadn't noticed when I heard the original words spoken to me in Greek. Panda Vojimazate. Somebody to tell me exactly how it's said. I can't do all the work. 
Mr. Sanchez. Yes, yes. Green Alerto for this. 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 Because he used to tell me, this is the apparent for the Tuaoristu and it takes things in the Ediariki. Who? Moro, that's correct. You avoided it because you are a woman. What's the name, Nasiani? What's the name, Nasiani? What are the officers in there? What's the name? A kinekos. Eri Tamala, Tahama. And she replies very cleverly, a kinekos, migarazi. Tamita, ξεχάσα το παιδί. Τα κρύβει. Να τα πληθυγεί απάντηση. Τώρα όμω το μάσο ήταν αυτό το πράγμα. Αλλά την έφτασε ω γυναίκα. Αλλά ω γυναίκα ενστικτοδό, επειδή αρνείται στο ισχυρόφιλο, όχι στο ασθενέ. Αποφύγανε το στόχο. Και δώσαμε την απάντηση, ενώ ο κύριο Πολυθάρα, ο πολύ καλοσύνη, έδωσε τη σωστή απάντηση, αλλά με αυτή την πικρή λεπτομέρεια. Τώρα μου θυμάστε. Πριν ανέκτο, ραφόμισε, πριν απάντηση. I can see one of you smiling and laughing. You, you, you. Wonderful. That's what a lecture should be. You must be happy. You must be interested. You must join. The teacher. It's a common venture. It works if you want to make it work. And it will fail, however good the teacher is, if you don't want to corroborate. So, the third innovation. And I'm fairly on time without timing it too much. The third innovation is Arandi, in the end, kills herself. Cuts his head and enters in Thebes holding the head and says, Look, I have killed a baby lion. Congratulate me. I've done a great service. I've killed the baby lion. And they're all surprised. It's the head of her son. And the father, who has spent that time collecting the seven bits of the dead grandson returns in Thebes, sees his daughter like that, and is asked to perform the impossible task of returning her to reality, <coughs> from a state of ecstasy and illusion. Now, what he does, psychiatrists whom I cite in the book, psychoanalysts, whom I cite in the book, describe it and say that what he does is entirely compatible with the modern way of doing it. Let me see if I can find it. Well, you see there's so many markers here. He says, Excuse me, I must read it because this is from a psychiatrist who's also a classical scholar. And he says, Euripides had observed and described accurately, understood intuitively, not only psychological illness, but also psychotherapeutic process. Freud stressed repeated that the poets had anticipated many of his clinical findings and theoretical conclusions. Another psychiatrist, a friend of mine from Harvard in New York, said, take away Shakespeare and 50% of Freud disappears. Take away the Greek myths and the other 
50% goes up in a puff of smoke. I don't know if it's right, but I didn't say it. A professor of psychiatry said it at Harvard University, Bennett Simon. And he continues here, second, the psychotherapy seen in the market, this is, I'm quoting, is clinically flawless and persuasive. It would bear comparison with any modern summary of a psychotherapy written by a professional clinician. And what does the father do? What the this? What the quacks? What the shamans? The laymen? The untrained doctors in Macedonia did at the time because they were the first to receive this phenomenon. And they were the first who had to study how the women would go into a state of ecstasy and after that they would be uncontrollable. And the answer is achieved with patience, with impartiality, with observation, and with every possible attempt to take the patient back into reality. You will read the next book. I'm not here to read my book or the tragedy where the father asks her when he sees her like that in the head. Look at the sun. Nothing to do with the murder. And she replies, yes. How do you feel? I already feel different. Better or worse? Hmm. Okay. Who was your husband? She remembers him. And do you have a child? She says, yes. Now, apparently, according to psychologists and psychiatrists, in cases like that, what you want to do is to get the patient to admit himself that that's what he's holding, the head of his son. It's no good for the patient to say, they tell me it's the head of my son. That's what the psychiatrist, I sat there, actually said. And Anandi responds in that way because she wants to avoid the responsibility. Her subconscious is telling her that for as long as you deny remembering the details of what has happened, you will not be responsible. So she says, Mulene. And the father comes back and says, now look, look carefully. What is it? And I'm reaching now two pages, but only two pages again. She shrieks, she shouts, and says, my God, it is my son. It's all the press. One of the people who has dealt with this is Professor Georges Devereux. He's a French, Hungarian, who get out, Professor de Sorbonne, <coughs> who wrote about classics and psychiatry. He's very loved, and those who have met him, he's dead now, described him to me as a quiet, nice, easy-going man. And uh, he said part of what I read out to you before. He said, this way is the way that a psychiatrist must act, not excitable, not with passion, not with a hurry, in a hurry. With a gradual effort to bring the patient back into contact with reality. <coughs> now, I am not a psychiatrist, but when I read psychiatrists of that decision, uh, dealing with cases like that and speaking so emphatically, at the very least I say, well, uh, there's something here worth looking into. And it helps me excite my audience. You know how difficult it is to stand before an audience for one hour? When I was teaching in Texas, I was teaching 8.30 to 9.30, 9.30 to 10.30, 10.30 to 11.30, 11.30 to 12.30, 12.30 to 1.30. <coughs> Exhausting. But it 
it's exhausting also for the students, the audience. You have to keep them awake. You have to keep them interested. You have to engage them if you want the subject, if you want our culture, if you want our history, if you want our religion to survive. You don't abandon the basic dogmas, but you adapt what you teach, how you teach, and you make sometimes compromises, even in religion. Otherwise, you face with people who would be very extreme and was harm in general. So, I want to try and bring all this to an end and show you some pictures. Because sometimes you know that music or pictures can help illustrate something in a better way than just words on abstract ideas. What I have there is an ancient 6th century vase which tells you why if you want to explain to an audience Greek tragedy through Greek pottery, you have great difficulties. And you guess why? This is fairly clear, but not entirely clear. The difficulty is that Greek pottery describes not just one event, but a history, a whole series of events, in a very small space, which is the circumference of the vase. Now this one sometimes will depict somebody with his external signs, a man with a trident or side, a woman with a helmet, Athena. But sometimes like this one, what is it? Now look at the difficulty. That's the whole circumference of the vase. That is why in my book, which I left there, I talk about Greek art by look, and mythology by looking at the Renaissance and Baroque art, where you have something more clear as you see in the middle. So, this is meant to be Menelaus threatening to kill Helen. It's taking place in the Trojan War, where the Greeks have burned Helium. And suddenly, Menelaus, hot blooded, sees his wife and wants to kill her. But Homer observes and understands humans and their nature. He knows that Menelaus is weak, and all it takes is for his wife to expose her breasts, and he changes his mind. He doesn't. Then you have a warrior return who holds a child from the leg and is threatening an old man. The old man is clear. It's another part of that play. That's why it's all compressed. Creon is murdered in a temple. The gods get cross because it's a sacrilege to kill somebody in the temple. And the child he's holding is the Octon is uh, Astyanus, the son of Hector. Why kill the child? So that there's no chance that the dynasty can revive. Brutality. Brutality. Nastiness. Throughout the Byzantine history, emperors, upon becoming emperors, would kill or blind their brothers and send them to the monastery in order to prevent a claim for the throne. So, here is the Octolemus. Why the Octolemus? He admits, tells us it's Odysseus who threw him off the walls of Troy and killed the child. And the other two women? We don't know. Now, sometimes you have what I say the uh, Baroque pictures, which make things very clear. This is uh, Sebastiano Ricci, a uh, Baroque painter, Italian, who depicts the moment where Zeus fertilizes Semele, but also kills her 
with the estampa. It's an amazing picture, not least because the choice of colors, the yellows, depict this thunder with ears. The God that collects the clouds. Wonderful descriptions in one word. A Greek talent. A few other races have that. They could create an image, an image, an eternal image with one word. La Bella, your Elena. How does Homer describe her? Third book of the Iliad. 
when Helen comes on the walls of Troy to see the duel between her former husband, Menelaus, and Miles, uh, an excellent. <coughs> and Helen appears covered in a white silk cloth and never utters a word. And all the old men at the king turn around and they say, My Lithia, Afti, Theatha, and on the basis of no word, what a turn for any author, not to spend words. By saying nothing, he said so much as to excite generations for centuries later. What culture, what talent did they have to be able to speak in this way? And by saying nothing, he creates an image. You can find philosophers who agree with this, Quintilian. You can find Lessing, who agrees that in his book on Love War. You can find all sorts of people. When I chose a politician, when I chose a politician two and a half thousand years later, because it is so marvelous. It is Greek. It is ours. And we don't know how to use it and exploit it. Now, let me take you to one famous vase, which is clear that it's Dionysus. It is uh, by one of the greatest sculptors of Greece in the 6th century BC, Ezekiel. And it is Dionysus in the ship. And the story was inspired because in the February of every year, the Greeks had the Anthestelia. They had a feast for the ripening of last year's wine. And even slaves and women were allowed to attend. They were all drunk for the sake of Dionysus. By the way, the Greeks, as you know, watered the wine. It was two to one, or three to one, it was not play. But he's lying on the beach in Naxos, and this ship of pilots goes by, they grab him, and they threaten to kill him. So he does the Theophania, his epiphany. He becomes the god, and he orders for wine to grow everywhere between the oars so the oars can't move and cover the ship and he's immediately surrounded by his favorite tigers and the sailors, the pirates, panic and jump into the water they become dolphins and they disappear. Now, a vase like that by Ezekiel is priceless and it would depend how he signed it. If he was the potter the man who just made the pottery, he would just say, Ebi, you Ebi, sir. If it was the artist who painted it, he would sign, Hegart. There are only eight of his that have the double signature, and they're priceless. But not in all the places was it right. The next picture I want to show you is Dionysus. It is the only piece of sculpture that I've heard <coughs> by Michelangelo which has attracted uniform criticism. It was done at the age of 19. So can you say he was too young? No. Because at the age of 20, he did one of his greatest masterpieces, the Pieta in St. Peter's, where the young virgin Maria holds in her arms the dead Christ, where the mother is younger than the son, because the old myth was that the virgin never grew old. And, and her eyes are closed eyelids. Because she's completely controlled and she doesn't want even to give the impression that she's crying. So it's on the age. What's wrong about this statue? Well, the first thing that 
everyone said from Vasari, who was the artist of the 16th century who wrote the lives of the great painters of the Renaissance, that it was too effeminate. He pointed at his chest and stomach and said that it was too effeminate. It was. But that's what Euripides had spent so much time describing in his play. And then modern people came and said that, mechanically speaking, this leg here to the left is too awkward, and if he really had a real person in that position, he would fall over. It's inaccurate in terms of balance. But nevertheless, it is an amazing sculpture which brings out a theme which Euripides brought out, as I told you, in the play. This next picture is the dismemberment of Penthes. His mother and his aunt, Inor and Aravi, are putting him to bits. If you read the Greek text, it's terrible. Because she says she puts her foot on his arm and puts the other foot there and pulls and pulls the arm out of its socket. It's the most marvelous description. But that's the religion, and that religion is followed by people. Why? Because they're lost, they're confused, they have no guide. They're trying to escape from the problems of a decaying society, of a dying world, before the new one has appeared. So, a god that is around for 1,200 years, a god that is so confusing and difficult, a god with different parents, a god who's barbarous and cruel, a god who can mislead people and drive them crazy, all well, these are good details if you want to be a scholar. You can read all these details. But is there a picture that I would like to leave you with? Yes. The details are there if you want to be a scholar, if you want to be an educated person. But I would like to leave you with a picture which is romantic, where the theme is love. First. And here is the marvelous piece, like common has had the most important painting by Titian, painted when in 1521. And what you have there is Dionysus, who's jumping out of his chariot because he sees on the island of Naxos the abandoned Ariadne. Myth and mythology. Theseus, the hero, he's a bastard. She saves him. She helps him kill the Minotaur, and he abandons her. He's a bastard. He rapes <coughs> Hippolyta and has with her the illicit son, Hippolytus. And then she, he kills her. In Phaedra, in uh, Hippolytus, the tragedy, he's never there. He's philandering with other women. In Phaedra, Hippolytus, he's completely different from his son. In a moment of excitement, he writes a letter to Poseidon, and he says, kill my son Hippolytus, kill my son Hippolytus, because he tried to make love to his mother. False. He reacts too quickly. He discovers it. And in the end of the tragedy, he spends all his time trying to get the innocent son to forgive him instead of trying for himself to understand the son who has spent all his life under the stigma of illegitimacy. <clears throat> no question of forgiveness by him. Back again to the words Sihonomi, and the religious word, Aphis. Aphis is something more than Sihonomi. There's no bargain. I do this, you do that. There's complete 
If you read again, Paul, so Paul, you will see that the office he comes from Christ because of two qualities that he describes in two beautiful Greek words. One is because Christ is, uh, I forgot what now, the, uh, yes, uh, uh, I forgot what I don't know, forgive me. Uh, there are two words. One is that he's proud, proud, wonderful word, proud. So is it a proud? And the other one is he is meticulous. You see, you know, two words that have come into the vocabulary. They didn't exist in the Greek vocabulary before the fifth century we see. They have come in with the Stoics and later with Christianity. And that's the complete forgiveness, which the son who's died because of the father's impetuosity gives to the father. But the father who has, through his impetuosity, killed the son, doesn't give to the son. I think it's amazing. And here, Ariadne sees him and falls in love with her, and he falls in love with her and says immediately, my queen, I'll take your crown and put it in the heavens. You see the stars out at the top left corner. He takes that and he throws the crown and you'll be my queen forever. And he had many children with her. Yes, the god, the crow. Yes, you have that, you have the other. I tell you, I want to finish on a nice story. And you know where you find that story? said, expressed, as I told you, in an opera. In an opera that perhaps not all have heard. You again. Well done. <coughs> oh, you read the book? I've seen the opera. Oh, you the opera? And who, who did the music? Strauss. And you have a wonderful scene. The first is the queen abandoned in Luxus. And she sings an aria which is very moving. It is, at least I'm high. There is a country, a state somewhere where peace and calm can be found. And that is only death. She's waiting. Hell. Hades. She's waiting in the island for the arrival of Hermes to take her to her death. And instead, he comes. And at that stage, you have one of the most beautiful, the most difficult coloratura arias by Zerminetta. Those of you who have read or seen that <clears throat> coloratura aria for a soprano is very difficult. The most difficult one is in the Queen of the Night in Mozart, in the uh, Magic Flute. The highest notes, the highest E in music. But the uh, Zerbieta aria, how does Mozart title this? Großmachtigen Prinzessin. Great and powerful princess. That's how the poem starts. It lasts 12 minutes. <coughs> And if you find it through the book, through the internet, listen to it because it is so beautiful. And the words are beautiful. Because this ordinary woman, Zerminetta, goes to the queen who's ready to commit suicide and says, You great and powerful princess, you cry because you've lost your lover. Do you think that an ordinary woman who suffers the same thing suffers any less than you? So, pull yourself together. Adjust and find another lover. And that is said in this coloratura aria, which lasts 12 minutes. Coloratura is when you have certain notes where instead of continuing with the word, you change it, you color it, you go up and down. It's very, very different. 
Catherine Dassala is a French uh, soprano or a tourist who has 65 now, and if you look at it in the internet, you find it. It lasts 12 minutes, but it is the most wonderful aria. It's the most wonderful compassion, forgiveness, calming for a frustrated love. An unrequited love, as David said, a love that was never fulfilled. A kind of love that Aphrodite never expressed. Aphrodite had all sorts of things, but two kinds of love she didn't have the romantic love and the mother in love. So, there you are. 45 minutes, 50 minutes. A god, complicated, dominating literature, dominating the human. For over 1,200 years, maybe 2,000 if you go up to 500 AD, all in a tragedy, which if you study and think, can have lots of lessons that are appropriate even to our times. Thank you. Καλησπέρα σα. Βρισκόμαστε με τον κύριο Αγαμέμνον Αποστόλου. Πείτε μα δύο λόγια για την αποψινή βραδιά. Ε, την αποψινή βραδιά είχαμε την τιμή να έχουμε τον κύριο Βασίλη ε, Μαρκεζίνη, ο οποίο μα εξέθεσε ε, κάποια ε, ζητήματα ε, τη ψυχολογία που βλέπουμε στην τραγωδία του Ευρυπίδη. Ε, Κυρίω στην τραγωδία των Βαχών, όπου συνδέει κάποιε από, ε, από τους στίχους του στίχου του δράματο ε, που έγινε στην αρχαιότητα με ηθικά και ψυχολογικά μηνύματα που μπορούμε να τα αντικατοπτρίσουμε στην εποχή μας. Σας ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ. Να είστε καλά. Ε, παρακαλώ.